Good morning. It's Outside the Classroom. I'm science teacher and meteorologist Ryan Miller. We really appreciate you joining us here. It's a cool day, not too cold, but I am wearing a hat because we are going to make this hat week on Outside the Classroom. So if you have a hat, a crazy hat, a comfortable hat, your favorite hat, a hat with your team on it, please do me a favor and do us a favor. Take a picture with your hat and share it with us and we would love to see your hat. So I'm wearing my hat today and it's actually working and functioning properly because it's a cool morning here. Let's get right to it. Today we are going to be talking about adaptation and in fact over the next few days we're going to be talking about adaptation. That is the theme of this week, adaptation. So let's get right to it. If you could do me a favor and uh, if you could start thinking about adaptation, we want to know what is your definition of adaptation? Could you think about the word adaptation for a moment? Have you heard of the word adaptation? Are there parts of the word adaptation that may actually get you to start thinking about the act, the definition. So with adaptation in mind, we would love for you to interact with us on Facebook right now. If you can go to Facebook or if your folks or your parents or your caregiver, babysitter, whomever, if they have Facebook, pay, uh, perhaps go to Facebook, search outside the classroom or search for WJLA and interact with us. We want to know how you would define uh, adaptation. So that's the word that we're going to be focusing on here today and for the week. This is the theme, adaptation. We want to define what that means before we get started looking at all of the ideas of adaptation. We also have some words that we can work on spelling together, together here. And uh, for this week, uh, for today I should say, the, the words we're going to work on here, number one, is focus. That is one word to work on and try to spell and practice spelling. Positive is another word. That's another word that we're gonna spell. And three, our third word of the day is adapt, which in many ways, and I am not an English teacher, but nevertheless, adapt is the root word that we have in adaptation. So those are our three words that we can practice spelling today and start thinking about a definition and putting together a definition of adaptation. We have lots of different ways for you to contact and get in touch with us here at Outside the Classroom. Whether it's on Facebook, you can go to uh, our Outside the Classroom website is on WJLA.com and certainly that's one of the ways you can get in touch with us. I'm on Twitter at Ryan Miller underscore WX. Instagram is where you will find me at Miller underscore weather and chime in a great resource for you to share photos and videos ideas activities as we're all in this together here and away from school outside the classroom we hope you use it as a resource to try and keep that learning process going chime in is a great way for us to show some of the things that are happening and at our website you can go to chime in it's right at the top of your screen and in fact uh, that's seven on your side but chime in is right there click on that and we have created these things called bubbles which are representing different topics so for example our bubble for outside the classroom is learning at home outside the classroom and let's show some of the things that have been sent to us uh, Namra painting Woodbridge Virginia sent us a little movie making a birthday card for dad I'm gonna get that going here that's a great activity spent to spend some time doing with your kids some artwork adapting as we're away from the classroom and trying to keep that learning process going doing some art at home that's a beautiful little uh, video there thank you Namra we also have home learning going on where uh, we're adapting to the lack of a classroom and the lack of gathering here but practicing our letters, adapting on how we learn. That's the whole uh, meaning of the show, basically. We're here to try and give you some ideas to keep learning. Francesca Branson, in a collaborative effort, they uh, at Madison High School in Fairfax County have a cooking lab that they're doing, and they've showed some of these lessons. You can go to our website, and they've put these lessons on YouTube. So, hey, check that out. A really interesting way to do some cooking and learn some of the science behind cooking. And uh, that is uh, a wonderful effort here that is showing up from Rachel Van Pelt in Madison uh, High School here in South County High School, David Long, two teachers. So David and Rachel, 
we appreciate you taking some time and showing us your cooking lab and your cooking demonstrations. And we would love to hear and see more of these from you, from whomever. So please get us on Chime In. And I have a question, actually. What is the state bird? Would you happen to know uh, what the state bird of Tennessee is? We're keeping score here right now. We're keeping score of all of the different things that's happening uh, as we keep track of the different state birds that we're seeing. And from a state bird perspective, on this map, the green states, we have identified the state birds. But if you know the state bird of Tennessee, would you please let us know? You can send us the information on Twitter. You can send it on Instagram, chime in, uh, or even on Facebook. So we're keeping track, and our goal is to fill this entire map up with all of the state birds. And if you are interested, actually, in a little geography, this map, our state bird tracker for outside the classroom, is at our website. You can download the map, you can print it out, and use that as a resource here to learn some of the positions of the states. Perhaps you can write in the actual birds in each of those states, or maybe draw it in if you're uh, a very proficient and very good artist. So please, Tennessee, if you can uh, listen to us out there and you know what that bird of Tennessee, the state bird is, please, we want to know. Um, if you're not from Tennessee, look it up and let us know. That'd be a great thing here. So we're going to continue talking about adaptation. If you have a definition of adaptation, share it with us. We want to know what you think adaptation means. And we're going to get right into some activities that you can do at home that encompass the theme of adaptation. All of that when we return. Welcome back. It's Outside the Classroom, and thank you for joining us today. And many of you are joining us on Facebook. Thank you as well, including Leolam Jor, who actually sent us a definition of what adaptation means to Leolam. And Leolam says it means to adjust. That's perfect. And in fact, adaptation is adjusting. And one of the things we'll share with you is our definition here at Outside the Classroom of adaptation. But that does not mean it is the definition of adaptation. You can have your definition in any way you want or consider. Adaptation in, in our sense is changing to better handle events happening around you. And looking at this full screen image here, you can see that we have the definition on the left, but on the right side is a very troubling picture. If uh, you are from the D.C. area or live around D.C., Ellicott City is a town north of Washington. It is almost between, in fact, it's closer to Baltimore, but it is between Baltimore and D.C. And Ellicott City has had some devastating flooding occur over the last several years. And in fact, this image is one of those flooding events. And Ellicott City has had to go through incredible adaptations to deal with this flooding. And adaptation in this sense is changing to better handle some of this incredible flooding conditions that they have had to experience. These cars are being tossed around. So when you think of adaptation, at least as I think of adaptation, it's the idea of changing for the better. It's coming up with ways to adjust so that you can handle things that happen for you. We here at Outside the Classroom are absolutely willing to be resources to you as we adjust and adapt to school being uh, not in session right now, at least physically, uh, but we're outside here and we are outside of the classroom and trying to give you as many resources as we can. Here's an interesting video we're going to get going to right now. Arts on the Horizon sent us this looking at the idea of adaption and looking at bees. Hello, hello, my name is Miss Natalie and I'm here with Arts on the Horizon to show you how to make your very own dun -dun -dun, Benny the Bee Puppet. Now what's great about this project is you already have all the materials at home, I bet. So grab an egg carton. The cardboard is especially nice because it holds the pigment really well. Uh, you'll need paint or markers or crayons. Again, use what's around some scissors, tape or glue, and uh, some cardstock or regular paper. So, 
to begin, what we'll want to do is cut along the horizontal edge like so to keep the segments together and that's going to be our little skeleton for the bees. Now these might be a little pointy so go ahead and cut around the edges to smooth them out so he's nice and round. Now, now the fun part begins. No, it just gets even more fun. So <laughs> Decorate like crazy. You can stay very natural and realistic and use yellow and put stripes on there. Or you can do a rainbow bee or throw puff balls on them to make them really fuzzy. Again, whatever you like to do. Now, once the body's good, let's go ahead and make some wings. Using that card stock, the wings sort of look like little hearts. So draw a sort of crescenty thing. <laughs> very specific and uh, experiment, see what you like, cut that out. And now you've got a couple of wings ready to attach to our bee bodies. Tape works a-okay. If you have little ones that play vigorously, uh, go ahead and glue would probably be a little stronger. Now, all that's left is a face and you can use Sharpie or googly eyes if you have them at home. You can get real adventurous with dangly bits and make little antennae or stinger, whatever you like to do. Now, once he's ready to play, go play. Benny the Bee loves to fly around really fast visiting flowers that you have in your backyard or introducing him to your new toys that you have um, or just playing freeze dance. He's an excellent dancer. So. Thanks for joining me and be sure to subscribe to Arts on the Horizon for other videos and until next time, so long. And thank you, Natalie, for that. Now we're going to think about bees for just a few minutes. Bees are really wonderful at adaptation and changing, and there are lots of considerations. I myself am a beekeeper, not a great one necessarily, but I do like to try and keep bees in my backyard for lots of different reasons. Number one, though, let's start thinking about bees and how they can change or how they have adapted to the environment that they work in and all around. Here is a, a picture of a honeybee, actually. And honeybees, from an adaptation standpoint and a biology standpoint, have many different adaptations. Can you think of how they can change to defend themselves? Well, honeybees can sting. That's an adaptation. You wouldn't want to get stung. I've been stung a couple of times before, not too many, but that's an adaptation. Honeybees have this distinct pattern of yellow and black. That's an adaptation as well. Honeybees have that yellow and black pattern to camouflage them when they're looking for pollen in flowers. So that's an adaptation to defend themselves. That's an adaptation to actually blend in and disguise themselves from possible predators. So adaptations in honeybees are certainly one of the great insects to look at with respect to adjusting to the environment. Let's take a look at a picture. This is, uh, or I should say, a little video here from the hive. This was my hive last summer. And during my hive last summer, I took this video and listened really carefully. You can see those bees buzzing around. And I had about 50,000 bees last summer operating and working within the hive. And they were producing honey and pollinating the vegetables and the flowers in the garden. And that is a great way to help adapt in your garden and uh, potentially get some of your vegetables or flowers to grow and spread even more. When you have a pollinator that's working to help the reproduction process for flowers. Now, the other day, we were taking a walk in the neighborhood, and take a look at this image. We saw a giant swarm of honeybees that were on a fence, and I took a little video. You can see the bees swarming in that little area of the fence. Why do bees do this? Well, it's an adaptation. They perhaps were getting too big for their hive, or perhaps they had a new queen that decided to leave. And so as an adaptation, the honeybees are out looking for a new home, a new residence. And so the honeybees are adapting by going out and searching for a favorable place that they can live. And 
as a result of this, the neighbors obviously did not want to have the honeybees hanging out on the fence there for obvious reasons. Um, one of the good things, though, from a honeybee keeper perspective is that honeybees this time of year, they're pretty docile. They're not going to actually uh, actively try to sting you unless you really get involved. So what the neighbor did was call the Northern Virginia Beekeeper Society, and they sent a beekeeper out. And that beekeeper was able to harvest the honeybees, not the honey, take the honeybees off of the fence. And uh, she did that with the aid of her five-year-old son, who was an adept learning beekeeper. And they scooped the bees up, put them in some boxes, and are taking the bees to an area where they can potentially have a new home. But from an adaptation standpoint, the only way you can realize if you've actually got the bees and you can take them away is to make sure the queen comes with you. So the beekeeper was meticulous in the sense of taking the bees and basically shaking them into a box, the box is at the bottom, and then would watch the bees. And if the bees started crawling out of the box and away and going back to the fence, that was an indication that was an adaptation, and, an, and the beekeeper was able to realize that, wait a minute, the bees and the queen didn't get into the box, because if the queen bee was in the box, the bees would not be leaving the box. So the beekeeper had to wait and see and make sure that the queen was in the box, grab the bees, hit the road, and everything was back to normal. We'll be back in just a moment or two. We're going to look at adaptation and go outside. Welcome back to Outside the Classroom. Outside at the moment here, we've got some clouds around us and it looks like we're gonna see some change in the weather coming up here this afternoon. So when you wanna think about adaptation, if it gets cold, you are adapting on a jacket, as simple as that. But let's go on an adaptation hunt. And here is a great idea for you to keep that learning process going, keep learning active and to get kids outside, whether it's outside of your house, your townhouse, your apartment building, a lot of kids, especially the young ones, like to go digging for bugs. And insects have a great way of adapting very quickly so that we can kind of learn from those on the fly adaptations, pun intended. So let's take a look right now. We've got uh, several pots that I have planted some vegetables and rocks and let's start flipping some rocks over and see what we can find. Aha! Just as I suspected. Now I grew up in Ohio and in Ohio we called these little insects potato bugs. I don't know why. I have no clue. But nevertheless that was the, the name we had for these bugs. And so let's look at an adaptation and we can see this quickly. We'll just give it a moment. It doesn't look like there's any insects in my hand, but if you give it a few moments and you're still and you're quiet, things are going to start to change. Things are going to start to modify. There are some insects in this hand of mine that are camouflaged. They have adapted to the current situation and as a protective mechanism, they have put themselves into a little tiny ball. And that little tiny ball provides the ability to defend itself from a potential attack. But more importantly, that tiny ball is a great way, and here comes one right now. You can see that one right there, sensing that it, wait a minute, is okay. Oh, closed up again. Here's an adaptation watch. When you get close to them, they will, well, this one's not scared anymore these insects, these potato bugs, and I'll tell you what, if you have another name for them, uh, let us know. Facebook is a great way to interact with us. If you have a question on Facebook or a comment, what do you call these little bugs? I've heard them called different names. Interact with us on Facebook, please. If you uh, would let us know, we want to hear from you. So we've got some insects and adaptation. So if you want to get outside today and learn, number one, the first thing you can do, 
is start to look for adaptation in insects. And it doesn't have to be potato bugs per se. It can be worms. It can be any type of organism that you have. I'm going to put those there for just a second. Start looking for and trying to observe any adaptations that show up. You can keep a journal actually and take pictures. We all have the phones with the cameras. You can take pictures of the organisms you find. See if you can make an adaptation journal, identify the organism, the actual scientific name of the organism, and see if you can illustrate how that organism adapts to changing situations. So some organisms like to roll up in a ball and camouflage themselves as if they look like a piece of dirt. Other organisms like to blend in and do other things, and we can look for some other organisms here. There's lots of different ones. I don't see any worms at the moment, but we've got plenty of potato bugs that are right here, and they are all rolling up into a ball as they uh, work to adapt to the current situation. We will have a lot more talking about adaptation and math and how you can adapt your teaching style as we're at home when we return. We've had them called rolly bugs, pill bugs, potato bugs. Thank you for interacting, uh, interacting with us on Facebook. Corey, appreciate the, uh, the input. We're looking at lots of different words and the idea and the theme of adaptation this week on Outside the Classroom. Here's another adaptation that we can take a peek at throughout time. Flowers right now, it's spring. Flowers have adapted and come out at different times of the month or different times of the spring season as an adaptation to all of the changes around us. We'll have more when we return. It's Adaptation Week. This is Outside the Classroom, and I'm Ryan Miller. Thank you so much for joining us. We are looking at all things adaptation as we adjust, and hopefully for the better, our lives to the surrounding circumstances, the weather, anything. So we're looking for ideas on adaptation, and we're looking for you to please let us know some things. And we are on Facebook. If you search for us on Facebook, we are on Chime In on WJLA.com. We want to hear from you. So please, from the adaptation standpoint, what's your definition of adaptation? What's a picture that you have seen of adaptation? So please let us know, and we are here for you. These are all of the different wonderful ways that you can stay in touch with me and with Outside the Classroom. Now, we have been asking for several different things, and one of the things we've been asking for is to try and name all of the state birds in the country. And the states that you see right here showing up on this map in green, those are states that we have identified the state bird. So for example, the cardinal is the state bird in Virginia and Indiana and Ohio and Kentucky. But please let us know if you know the state bird or would be willing to research the state bird in Tennessee. We would love to find that out. West Virginia, what's your state bird? Some of you watching in West Virginia, please let us know. If you don't know it, then look it up and then maybe we can both learn things at the same time. So please keep track of those state birds. This map is on our website. You can download the map and keep score at home. You can color in those states as we have uh, uncovered the state bird for each. You could draw in some of the uh, birds that you see there if you have some talent or just simply write the birds in. That's probably what I would do because I am not good at drawing. Uh, but there's our state bird tracker that's on the outside the classroom website. So 
Let's get right to it. Adapting our lives to our current circumstances. There are ways that we can actually help to benefit the learning process, to work with our kids, to work with the children, whomever you're caring for at home right now to keep learning going. One of, and I'm an educator, have been teaching for 18 years. One of the core principles of teaching from my mind is to look at something called the theory of multiple intelligences. And an educational researcher, a gentleman by the name of Howard Gardner, came up with this idea of multiple intelligences. And you can search for Howard Gardner and go online, take a look at some of the things that he has been able to put together. But Howard Gardner and the idea of multiple intelligences, here's a great assessment, by the way. You can go online, fill this out, and it will tell you what it thinks from taking this survey your multiple intelligence is. And you can use that data to help figure out what type or how to design the activities you're doing with your kids at home. Perhaps you're an active and kinesthetic learner, meaning that you like to move around. Perhaps in, in my multiple intelligence that is the strongest for me is nature and being outside. I learn best when I'm out there. So we're all different, and the idea of using our multiple intelligences to try and cater teaching is one of the ways to make learning a bit more efficient. A couple of other ways to think about it would be to try and ask your kid before you start doing a lesson, what do you know about that topic, soliciting the prior knowledge. And if you can get the prior knowledge from your child, if you can identify that multiple intelligence that your child uh, certainly gravitates toward from a cognitive standpoint, or if you can make learning active, you're going to find that teaching becomes much more efficient and really, it's about learning. It's not about completing worksheets or just simply doing tasks. It's about learning something new every day. We're going to learn lots of different things here coming up in just a few moments, but here is a nice, interesting look at how to learn and use adapt adaptation with literature. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for letting me make a literacy connection today to your theme of adaptation. You know, it's very easy for us to change our modes of speaking depending on the audience before us. It's called code switching, and we do it intuitively from a very early age, knowing that we can be more colloquial with friends or family members than someone in a position of authority, like a teacher or a minister or an employer. But making that connection that there are different ways to adapt communication skills in writing it's a little bit more challenging. And now that we're homeschooling, parents, you have an opportunity to really help your student navigate this process, particular with middle grades and upper grade students. It's really challenging for them to often see their intended audience when they're writing. Now, right now we're in a particularly confusing time because while an assignment may have been given by a teacher, it is often you, the parent, who's the, <laughs> the audience right now. But we need to help our students navigate that there are in fact different ways and modalities of writing depending on who will be reading that which we compose. So I would say to you, maybe now is not the time to assign writing to your child. Let your teacher do that. Let him or her give the direct feedback. But you have a unique opportunity to model because you are teleworking from home, doing writing every day in lots of different formats. So. Show and share with your kids how your writing changes and adapts depending to the different requirements of your jobs. For example, show them your brainstorming process. At school where are lots of graphic organizers and Venn diagrams, maybe you just find a bunch of post-it notes lying around that you use to scribble your thoughts down. Open your email or print out an exchange between you and some colleagues so they can see that as you flesh out your ideas, you include evidence, you include counterclaims, you're bantering back and forth in short, terse sentences. But then, when it comes time to actually draft the work, perhaps you have much more lengthy prose, you've got more adjectives and descriptors that you actually edit and revise in lots of different ways, by highlighting, by using a pen or a pencil, by sharing Google Doc comments with a colleague, this is all part of the writing process and all important for your son or daughter to see. And finally, show them how the written product can differ. 
students often have a difficult time believing that a five paragraph essay is what we're going to turn in in life. True, but all of the skills and analysis that our children need to learn through a five paragraph essay apply even when you're producing a report or a PowerPoint. So share this opportunity for you to model the different modes and adaptations you make with writing as you go through a process that may be a couple of days, a couple of weeks, or even longer. Have fun writing. Hi there, I'm Ryan Miller, science teacher and meteorologist, and this is Outside the Classroom. Thank you for joining us. We are looking at adaptation as it can be applied to all of the different things that we're looking at and observing and certainly adjusting to in our lives as uh, we're away from the classroom. So thank you for joining us. We're on Facebook. If you wanted to reach out to us, ask a question, say good morning or hi, we would love to hear from you at Facebook. Just search for WJLA and you will find us on Facebook. We also wanted to make sure and remind you of a couple of things. We've got some words of the day. Practice spelling these words at home. Get out the sidewalk chalk or maybe cut the letters out. Do something. You can adapt this in any different way, this activity, based upon how your child learns best. But focus, positive, and adapt, which is the root of adaptation. These are the words we're asking you to spell, and I will definitely love to show you spelling these words out here if you want to send us a video or send us a picture, that'd be great. It's also crazy hat week or just hat week. Nothing crazy about this. It's actually pretty chilly out right now. So wear your favorite hat, take a picture. We want to see your crazy, your favorite, your comfortable hat, whatever it is that you are certainly wearing. Share with us, please. We're here as a resource for you. Adaptation can be applied to a few different things. Take a look at this video. My kids and I took a road trip a couple of uh, years ago and we went to a very unique place on the earth. And if you're looking at this video at home, you'll notice that we're doing an activity that many folks do. But notice what my kids are wearing. They're not wearing snowsuits or hats. That's not snow. That is actually something called gypsum. Gypsum is a mineral that can form and break apart from rock. And as gypsum accumulates, there are very unique places that we can see gypsum showing up. And in fact, in our country, we're very blessed. Let's take a look at a picture here. Here's another picture. You can see the sledding occurring. But then let's focus on the idea. This is white sands. National Monument in our country in Mex New Mexico. And if you have the opportunity and would like to uh, take a little uh, drive, not a little one, a big drive actually, or fly out to New Mexico, I highly recommend White Sands. My daughter Kennedy sitting right here laying in the gypsum. It's not sand, it's gypsum. And the unique component of gypsum is this, that if you took gypsum, a handful of that quote unquote sand or what it looks like snow and you put it in water, the gypsum would dissolve. So what does that tell you about white sands? Well, let's take a look at white sands. We've got a map up here on Google Earth. We're going to focus in on white sands and I'll show you where it is. New Mexico is right here. And in fact, from a zoomed out perspective, you can actually start to see this big conglomeration of gypsum in New Mexico. So I'll zoom in. And to the west of the Lincoln National Forest and to the east of Truth or Consequences, you're going to find the White Sands National Monument. And the unique thing about White Sands, and we can kind of zoom in or zoom out, uh, is that it has all of this gypsum which has worn and eroded off of the mountains. But as I told you, gypsum, if you put some in water, would actually dissolve. So from an adaptation standpoint, what does that tell you about this part of New Mexico? Well, it should probably indicate to you that it does not rain there quite a bit. 
If it did rain there, you wouldn't see all of this gypsum. You wouldn't see all of this white sand. So gypsum is certainly one of the things that if there was an adaptation that was showing up, there are my kids playing on the dunes at White Sand. Such a unique and interesting place to visit. The plants have adapted to the gypsum in the soil and the dry conditions. But in New Mexico, in this part of the country, it doesn't rain much. And as a result of that lack of rain, we've got the accumulation of gypsum. So this is a really unique and, and interesting opportunity. If you're at home and you have internet access, go to Google Earth check out white sands and see all of the unique features from a geologic standpoint that are all around this very interesting place in the United States. We're going to take a look outside at some more adaption and we're going to look at math as you can apply it to adaptation coming up in a bit. Rachel Kay here and to go along with this week's theme of adaptation I have a challenge for you guys specifically a photo hunt these can be pictures you go out and look for around your house around your neighborhood or you can perhaps look through photos you've already taken great thing to do with your kids and look for images that represent adaptation I've got a few pictures that I've taken I'm very lucky a few years ago I had a chance to go on a safari in southern Africa and that's a place where adaptation is just all around you because of the animals and you can see how they've adapted to their environment so I've got a few examples for you here Start Starting with elephants, why do you think elephants have adapted to have such large ears? Well, there are a couple of reasons. One, well, the main reason being to help keep them cool, and it does that in two ways. One, the veins in their ear are more exposed to the cooler air, and it helps to cool the rest of their bodies as well. And then two, the big ears can help to act a little bit like a fan. Another animal that I noticed had larger ears, not as large as an elephant necessarily, but larger than our pets at home are wild dogs. They have larger ears to help them with hearing, hearing their prey, hearing perhaps their predators, and also hearing the rest of the pack. Another way that wild dogs have adapted to live in the wild compared to our furry friends at home is through teamwork. So they hunt together in packs, and that's a really big part of how they're able to survive. And then I've got one last image for you here. Look closely. This is a leopard. If you've ever wondered why leopards adapted to have spots, well, it's for camouflage. These are pretty hard to see in the wild, very rare to find because they blend in so much. So I've circled them here. Hopefully that helps point it out. We've got a leopard mama and her cub as well. Now you don't have to be looking for animals in Africa or even in your neighborhood. You can look for anything. A plant adapts as well. Send your photos to chime in, wjla.com slash chime in. We'd love to see what you come up with. And we're also on Facebook. Please just search for WJLA on Facebook and we would love to hear from you. Speaking of adaptation, and Rachel, thank you so much for that package. We have an idea that you could possibly do at home. I live on a very quiet street, but adaptation from a math perspective could be looked at this way. If you wanted to take your road or the sidewalk you live on, you can go to Google Earth, we were just there a moment ago, and measure out the distance or the length on your street. And you can set up a start and a starting line and a finish line. And then we've got three modes of transportation right here. And from an activity standpoint, you can look at as you adapt and change things like the size of your wheel or the mechanisms you use to get around, how does that impact the speed that you travel? So I'm gonna ask my kids here to jump on a couple do you want to get on the bike? Uh, that's a little too high for you. You got it. Oh boy, famous last words right there. Let's adjust. Hey, Seton, can you ride the bike and you ride the scooter? Because I don't have time. There's only a couple minutes left on the camera or on the uh, show here. So you got the scooter, hit it. Measure the time it takes to go the length of your street using a scooter. You could turn around. And ultimately, 
come back and then he can jump on the skateboard or the bike. So this is an idea that you could actually measure out and time. We've all got timers on our phones. Time how long it takes to travel a certain distance and then calculate the speed. Now I know many of us might be math averse, but to do a speed calculation, it's actually pretty easy. Speed is equal to the distance you travel divided by time. And I'm running out of chalk. All right, so distance over time. So this is an idea that you could do by adapting your mode of transportation and seeing how that impacts travel time. That's just a thought that you can think of. We have to adapt all the time. Uh, my daughter did not like the fact that she couldn't ride the bike and I didn't prepare, so she adapted by going inside and being frustrated. So with this period of time, it's about being patient. It's about being flexible. It's trying your best to design activities that would certainly allow, certainly allow for the learning process to continue while we're away from the classroom. I'm Ryan Miller and more when we return. You can keep going. One of the goals of Outside the Classroom is to establish contact and to be a resource to anyone that's out there as we're away from the classroom. And if you wanted to get in touch with us, there are lots of different ways to do that. I'm on Twitter. You can take a look at my Twitter handle, which is at Ryan Miller underscore WX, which is the abbreviation for weather. I don't know why. You can also go to Instagram, but Facebook is a really great and quick way to interact with us. If you go to Facebook and search for WJLA, you will quickly find us and us on live, Facebook Live. Please interact, ask us questions. If you need an idea for something, I'm here as a resource to help you out. I've had 18 years in the classroom and would be willing to spend some time with you. But we also wanna see your photos. We wanna see your videos and that would be great and the best way and easiest way to share those with us is if you go to the chime in section of our website, wjla.com. So please get in touch. We're here for you and we would love to interact and spend some time. Here's another idea. This is another adaptation as it shows up in math uh, that you can do and it's also related to how we live our daily lives and the weather. So we all use different forms and different units of measurement for temperature. And as a meteorologist, we use Fahrenheit here in this part of the world, but some parts of the world use Celsius. So if you wanted to convert from Fahrenheit and adapt your Fahrenheit numbers over to Celsius, well, there are three easy steps that you can do with some math. So here's a perfect example, and this is how you can get mathematics out at home and start thinking about it. You could start by looking at what the temperature is where you are, if that's something that would be more relative, or you can use an example number. So let's say it's 100 degrees and it's sweltering. It's obviously not right now, but let's say it's 100 degrees Fahrenheit right now. And how would I convert 100 degrees Fahrenheit to Celsius? You don't need a calculator to do this. You can do it longhand. Calculators would certainly make it quicker. But if you take 100 degrees and you subtract 32, that's your first step. If you subtract 32, you get a number of 68. So 100 minus 32 equals 68. Okay, that's step one. And then you're gonna take 68 and multiply 68 by five. And when you multiply 68 by five, for those of you keeping score at home, it's 340. I did not do that in my head. I just wanted to let you know that. That is a calculation I did with a calculator to do it quickly. So we're converting 100 degrees Fahrenheit to Celsius. We take 68, multiply it by five, it's 340. 340 divided by nine will put you at 37.8 degrees Celsius. So that is how you can take a number and adapt your number to another unit. And that's an idea for you to do something at home. I'm Ryan Miller, this is Outside the Classroom, and we really do thank you for joining us. If we can help in any way, we're here for you.